Loading into the now available Humankind Batuta beta update, Steam on Windows, reveals a huge host of changes to the game, from those religious changes to cultural balancing, vassalization, the militarist affinity, you name it, we've got it, let's talk. We're also 900 subscribers away from our target. I'll stop pestering you, but I will let you know that there's time cards below, because there's a lot of information in this video. Let's jump in, subscribe, and begin. Uh, firstly, they did release a wonderful blog post where they detailed all of the different changes, including some nice little blurbs about the culture changes, like the Phoenicians, who are now much better at sailing across the sea, or the Goths, who can, as you can see from this image, and as you'll see from some footage later in the video, are a little bit more handy at their science game. The nomadic units in the game, particularly the Huns and the Mongols, now can sort of find food in the same way that the Bantus can. And the Americans are much better at bombing people. More on that later in the video, though. I do already have a separate video if you want all of the information on the cultures. However, in this one, I'm going to give you the smorgasbord look at the update. So, where should we begin? Let's start by some sweeping changes that affect a load of different civs. And that is count as commons quarter and count as religious district. Here you can see our newly buffed friends, the Goths, taking advantage of this ability here. Basically across the board and across all sections of humankind, a whole load of districts have now been reclassified as commons quarters and or religious districts. By and large, it tends to be fairly intuitive and it makes sense, but if you want to see the full list, here it is. Uh, and you can see that these are the ones that have been reclassified as religious districts. It combos very well with the changes that I'll discuss in a minute about religious tenets. But you can also see here that some have been reclassified as counting as commons quarters. Sometimes, as is the case with the Goths, we get both. So it's not just these overarching changes coming to culture, like you can see here the Goths going in for a ransack, earning twice as much science as they will money from it, where money is its primary yield. I'm getting ahead of myself, though. We'll cover those changes, at least the important ones, a little bit later in the video. Let's go back to talking about these very important cultures that have now been given religious districts and commons quarters. In humankind, we have a variety of civics at play. Here you can see a very early one, personal rights, providing a minus 30% discount on the industry or production cost for religious districts. This no longer just applies to, say, holy sites or perhaps religious wonders. Also, it's important to note here, while we're talking about classifications, that there are other civics at play. There's actually a lot of them, uh, like public happiness here, a minus 50% industry cost on commons quarters. Garrisons as well, a little bit of love in this update, but the commons quarters one is particularly special here because now the emblematic quarter for, say, the Goths can be built in half the time. Now that these religious districts can sometimes be built much, much quicker, why would I want to do them? Well, I've got good news for you, curious humankind player, for the religious tenets have been upgraded as well. And these are sweeping upgrades from across the board, and they're upgrades in the most powerful of places. Generally speaking, if, and I'll show you a variety of footage on screen here so you can get a feel for all of the different ones, but generally speaking, if a religious tenet, whether it was in tier one, two, three, or four of humankind's faith and religious system, if that provided you with food, or industry, or science, or money, the FIMS resources, as well as in many cases the ones that also, or uh, alternatively, I should say, provide stability or influence, those all now provide a further plus two of their respective resource on all of your religious districts. All of them. So, you saw some examples from one. Let's have a look now, a, a slightly closer dive. So, Reject Luxury now provides plus two money. Be Virtuous as Water provides plus two stability on our religious districts. Shelter providing influence on them. You'll notice that the military ones, the combat ones, generally don't receive any extra benefits, right? Smite Unbelievers remains unchanged. However, as we look back at the FIMS ones, the science, the industry, the food, you'll see that they're all providing now the benefit that they used to give, plus five science on strategic resource deposit in this case, but also plus two science on the appropriate religious districts, all of those districts. This is a sweeping and significant change. Think about how this adds up over the course of a game. Plus two money from my tier one, plus two science from my tier two, industry from tier three, 
And then, I don't know, maybe some more science again from tier four. All of a sudden, every single district that's a quote unquote religious district, a reminder we have lots of them, is now providing me with a whole load more yield. Also, of course, you can now actually see, as you can see on screen, the different uh, effects that civics will provide. So now we know how to unlock them and also what they'll do once we get them. It makes this strategy even easier to put together. Uh, here you can see from yesterday's live stream, a religion that I've sort of nearly finished building. As compared to the old version of humankind, in this version, I'm receiving a total of plus six additional science on every single religious district and a little bit of extra money. Here you can see it playing out on a goth district, for example, insanely good. In fact, it's almost really better than my actual research quarters. It's only a few science short, and it's providing me with so much more. more. The final piece of this puzzle, actually, to briefly interrupt myself, is this little note in the patch notes. Civics. Reduce the cost of impact of the number of enacted civics. So civics are now cheaper later in the game. Attaching outposts. Reduce the impact of already attached territories by 40%. So cheaper merging of cities as well. Reduce the impact of infrastructure buyout cost by over 50%. There are various small influence scaling changes here. Nice. Now, let's talk about the militarist affinity ability. Another big change. I argue that the militarist affinity in humankind is actually already uh, very, very powerful. Now, in this update, we've seen them do a couple of things. Here you can see, by the way, some old footage of me sending a tidal wave of iron reserves. If you're unfamiliar with how it works, basically, when you're playing a militarist culture, your ability lets you summon some levies. These militia units that would normally be called to defend a city can now be summoned as active units. Here you can see me using the Iron Reserves ability. Now, in this update, we can actually upgrade these peasants along one of the standard military upgrade pathing lines. Okay, so these units, as you can see here, the peasants can be upgraded into pikemen. This is, of course, quite useful because now they can be turned into an anti-cavalry unit. They'll also pick up other benefits as well, a little bit of extra combat strength that kind of thing. But what this enables us to do now in this new version of Humankind is really upgrade these units that we can spam out a reminder all the time. The Militarist Affinity ability takes four population from a city and converts them into units that you're free to move around and use however you like. There are a few changes to that though. Some things have been buffed, other things have been nerfed. Firstly, the militia units that are created in the later eras of the game cost two population each, not one. So now you'll take, for example, eight pop to raise the four units out of the city instead of the four population it required before. The militia units can be upgraded, as I say, into professional units always along the anti-cavalry branch. So these pikemen, the fantastic looking ones, by the way, in this fight in particular, uh, are not alone, starting from spearmen, ranging through to rifles. Uh, a little bit of nerfing though, the militia units are no longer free to heal, that was insanely powerful, can't do that anymore. They also fixed and exploit the created population when upgrading and disbanding them. You can do weird things with them by moving them around, shifting them across, putting them into cities, disbanding them into cities where you didn't create them, that kind of thing. Uh, and finally, they've also adjusted the ability cooldown a little bit to scale with game speed and army size. In a nutshell, what you need to know here is that the militarist ability is less spammable than before, and slightly more expensive. I argue it's still a very powerful one though, and now that we can upgrade the militia units into actual military units, no offense peasants, you were good sometimes, but now that we can upgrade them into that, we can give them specific upgrades in battle, like, as I say, being good against mounted units, or bringing guns to a knife fight. It looks really cool. I'm looking forward to play testing it a little bit more. Which brings us through into the nuts and bolts of the update, the cultures. To try and make this information a little bit more digestible and to really give you what you need, I'm going to include everything, but really focus on the winners and losers. If you want the full deep dive, like I say, I have a 20 minute video where I go through all of these changes. In this video though, let's focus on those real gainers and a couple of losers, but thankfully there aren't too many. In the ancient era, I think that the Phoenicians, the Hittites, and the Olmecs are the big ones to watch. Uh, the Phoenicians can now get across the sea much easier. 
Their naval transport is unlocked faster than any other culture in the game now. And they move faster at sea. That's their new strength. The Hittites' outposts are now much stronger than they used to be, providing plus 20 of the FIMS resources. In exchange for their wheel technology upgrade that they used to have, the Hittites are now much better as well. And finally, the Olmecs got a nice cheeky little buff. Their EQ now gives plus three influence per territory. The Mycenaeans come out of this era looking a little bit worse for wear, losing their industry bonus. Kind of a shame. They were kind of a secret powerhouse with that one. However, moving along to the second era, the classical era, the real winners here are the Romans and the Goths by far and away. Uh, the Romans are an interesting one. They're kind of, in my opinion, better at building cities and slightly worse at fighting. You now get plus 50 fame if completed, if your EQ is completed, I should say, while a city is victorious from winning a fight. So there is some fighting synergy also get a little bit of extra influence and stability out of them. Nice overall upgrade, I think, to the Romans at a slight cost of their strength. The Goths are the really spicy one, though, with ability now to get science from ransacking and ransacking gains being removed from their trait and added to their emblematic quarter. This means that you can build and stack a lot of these. It is, as you saw at the start of the video, also like many others now qualified uh, as a commons quarter and a religious one. I won't note that every time because we've talked about the impacts of that already, but it is very good. Uh, lastly, of course, the Huns and the uh, Mongols in the next era receive some changes as well, which probably makes sense to talk about the next era now because, as you can see on screen, it was a fairly lightly changed one. The winners and losers, the key takeaways here are fairly straightforward. The Mongols, just like the Huns, can now receive uh, a little bit of, well, effectively they've been given the Bantu upgrade, where now you can find curiosities that give you food, instead of having to fight for food for these nomadic units to multiply. The Aztecs are the only other culture in this era that received any change. Overall, it's, again, all about the emblematic quarter, but also they have this neat little ability where you can sacrifice a population to get plus one combat strength on all of your units. That is very good. I think the Aztecs are a key winner in that era, actually. Next up in era number four, we actually have, dare I say, maybe the first of our big losers, except for the Mycenaeans, it's Ming. Ming was slightly reworked. You now receive plus one, uh, sorry, plus 10 influence per enacted civic instead of plus one influence on territory. I'm not actually entirely sure uh, the overall power level of Ming has been reduced by too much. I should note also, though, of course, that their EQ no longer provides stability. Another slight downgrade to Ming. They are a little bit of a loser in this era. However, there are a few winners coming up, mainly the Venetians. Uh, Spain also get a slight buff to their stability which is nice, but that's kind of all that they get. Really, the winner here is the Venetians. The Venetians come out looking much stronger in terms of wealth and influence. You'll be able to generate uh, basically, on average, plus one extra money and plus one extra influence on their EQ. That's every single EQ. Don't forget, the emblematic quarter can be built on all territories, providing you have space to build it, of course. Some of these ones can be a little bit tricky. But either way, nice to see some love. For the Venetians. Moving along to the industrial era, we have another real standout winner here and a few changes around the edges. For me, the standout winner in the industrial era is the French, who have been restored to their glory. Amplitude, you've done your people proud. The French EQ, their emblematic quarter, now loses the ring fenced collective minds ability. Basically, you used to have to enact collective minds in order to get any real value out of it. That was fine when humankind first came out, but now that collective minds, the scientific ability, can only be used on one city at a time, it made it really bad. The French have now been let loose, unchained. They also get plus two science per trade route, a nice little bonus stacked on top. Uh, my French districts are now back to providing me with some really nice, sometimes triple digit science on every single one. It's great to see them back where they were in their glorious overpowered spot. Uh, the rest of the cultures in this era have a few changes around the edges. Um, I think of note, the Ethiopians got the nice sort of uh, goth-like upgrade where their district now counts as, interestingly for them, 
properly a garrison, but also a commons quarter, um, and also a little bit of extra science coming out of your garrisons as the Ethiopians, that nice underlying extra science gain. Uh, Zulu and the Russians receive a few small changes as well to slightly buff them. Next and finally, we have humankind's last era, the contemporary era. The Americans are the big winner and the Japanese are the biggest loser here. However, all five of these changes are kind of spicy. So here's what you need to know in a nutshell. The USSR, the Soviets unit, is slightly weaker now if it's not supplied. In fact, it's much weaker because you don't get the combat strength bonus of your guns. The Americans receive a global bombard strength buff and their district is now actually a little bit better at making money and influence, sort of, because it counts as a commons quarter. The Japanese lose their ability to get plus two science and plus two industry effect on local territory. That has now been restricted on their EQ. And the Turks and the Brazilians get a little bit of extra food and science around the edges. Nice changes to them. Although honestly, in the contemporary era, it can be difficult to really judge the overall power level of cultures because it's an era with such high yields. You have all of your civics, all of your faith and your tenants and your cities are massive. They've got lots of infrastructure. It makes sense that yields would be very high. So it's a little bit difficult for me to judge. But when I look at something like the Brazilians and I see that their EQ now gets plus three science per adjacent farmers quarter, plus one researchers slot, it now actually counts as a research quarter. The Turks trait is buffed. You now get plus three food per population instead of plus one. I see some nice, relatively small, but impactful scaling bonuses for both of them. But really, like I say, in terms of overall, uh, maybe player of the game change, it's the Americans that receive the greatest benefit here. Are they overall going to be the most powerful culture in the game? Uh, probably not. I think they're still actually, believe it or not, a little underwhelming but they're definitely the most improved in this era. Thank you very much for watching. I will continue to cover this update, both probably in live streams and maybe in some more videos moving forward. There's a lot of glorious detail hidden inside of this beta update. Uh, as a gentle reminder here at the end of the video, because somebody will ask in the comments below, anybody can download this beta. It's available for, at the moment, two weeks on Steam and Windows. So you do need to be playing on Windows and Steam to download it, but it is a free for all. And I'd encourage you to do it because it is a whomper of an update. Thanks everybody. See you next time.